Hello and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Nothing fuels international conflicts like oil. Numerous historical wars have been driven by this precious resource. Oil drove the Iraq-Iran tanker war, the invasion of Kuwait. Oil also drove the invasion of Iraq. Today, as we discuss Ukraine, it's a unique example. Oil may not have triggered the war in Ukraine, but the West has now hijacked it, and they've turned it into an oil war. The U.S. is trying to rig the oil market by using Ukraine as an excuse. So far, the U.S. has banned Russian oil. The West has secretly bought Russian oil. The U.S. has lectured the world on Russian oil. The White House has tweaked its West Asian diplomacy to navigate Russian oil. 107 days into the Ukraine war, the West is trying to decide how much the world should be paying for Russian oil. It is trying to rig the oil market. On the show tonight, we will tell you what the West is scheming. Also on the show, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is launching his re-election bid as he also prepares to launch an offensive in Syria. We'll discuss the implications. The World Health Organization seems to have finally woken up. Dr. Tedros and his team say they want to investigate the lab leak theory on the Wuhan virus. And America is bracing for a Sriracha shortage after ingredients of the hot sauce were burnt by climate change. Why did the U.S. go to war in Iraq? George Bush justified it as a hunt for weapons of mass destruction. But none were found in Iraq. Former U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel declared in 2007 what the world had long known. He said, people say we are not fighting for oil. Of course we are. And the proof is for the world to see. After a decade of war, three big oil companies of the West set up shop in Iraq. Cut to 2022, the West is engaged in a new war. The battleground is Ukraine. Yes, Western troops are not fighting there, but their governments are supplying weapons and they're slapping sanctions. And once again, it is oil that is shaping this conflict. The West wants everyone to stop buying Russian oil. The US and some of its allies have banned Russian oil imports. Europe is planning an embargo and developing countries like India are under pressure to comply. The plans of the West are not succeeding, so they've come up with a new strategy. The US and Europe want to form an oil cartel, a cartel that will decide how much the world ends up paying for Russian oil. Some extreme measures are being discussed here, and these could have a direct bearing on India. So what is the West planning? Allow me to explain. There are talks that are on between the US and Europe. The idea is to limit what Russia earns from oil. And the solution, they think, is a buyer's cartel. They want to rig the market against Russian oil. How would they do that? The European Union has a key role to play in this. Collectively, this bloc, the EU, will set a lower price for Russian oil. It will be less than what they're paying right now. So if Europe demands a lesser price, the others will follow. At least that's what their plan is. America is aggressively pushing for this cartel. U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen is spearheading the talks. This is what she said about it. I think a lot of people, including me, find it appealing from a general economic point of view. The larger the cartel, the better. Pay less for Russian oil. That's what she's suggesting. Everyone will demand the same price. No one will complain since they're getting cheap energy. At the same time, less chaos goes, less cash rather, goes into Russia's war chest. Sounds like a great idea, but it's not. There are fundamental issues with how the plan will be executed. First, what would this oil cartel do about existing contracts with Russian supplies, the ones that Europe has already committed to. What happens to those contracts? Second problem is divisions within Europe. Even now, the EU cannot agree on an oil embargo on Russian oil. Countries like Hungary and Slovakia are not on board. They've rejected the idea because they depend heavily on Russian energy. How will a divided Europe agree on a single price for Russian energy? The United States realizes Europe's limitations, so it is taking the matter to the G7. It is talking to the group of seven. It could force other countries to accept these price caps. 
countries like India and China, there are two options. Number one, the insurance companies. How would this work? You see, shipments of oil are often insured in Europe or the United Kingdom. Oil shipments do not move around without insurance. That's how they work. So they will insure only those shipments that fall under the agreed price cap. G7 countries are exploring this idea. So any country outside Europe must comply with this price cap, force Russia to sell its oil for less. Only then will their shipments be insured. That's one way for them to force the hand of others through insurance. Option number two is sanctions, and this is a more targeted measure, one that America could execute single-handedly. What will these sanctions look like? The U.S. will set the parameters of the purchase, basically dictate the price at which countries like India should buy Russian oil. What if they refuse to comply? They will be cut off from U.S. financial systems. That's what this oil cartel would represent. U.S. and allies say they want to ensure economic stability, that they want to stop financing the war in Ukraine. But in reality, they'll end up influencing the global prices of oil. This is economic warfare. Yes, the idea of cheap Russian energy does sound appealing. But will Moscow agree to this? Will Russia sell its oil at a price that the West dictates? Vladimir Putin is making threats. The Russian president says if Europe jettisons Russian oil, it will commit economic suicide. That's the term he used. Moscow has already cut gas supplies to countries which refuse to pay in rubles. What if Russia decides to cut global oil supplies? It will cost them a lot, but it will also hurt others. The war and Western sanctions have weakened the global economy. Shortages of all kinds, from food to fuel, are driving up inflation. Many countries are struggling to stay afloat. The West now wants to turn this conflict, the conflict in Ukraine, into an oil war. Just like the war in Iraq, it's a conflict that the world can do without. It's also a conflict that the world is paying a price for. What's the best way to win an election? Campaign well, govern better. But what if you fail to do that for 20 years? Then you look for distractions. Just ask the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, or should I say, Turkiye. He has been leading this country for 20 years, first as prime minister, then as president. But in June next year, Erdogan faces a stiff challenge because 2023 is election year and Erdogan wants another term in office. Just one problem, though. His track record is pathetic. Take a look at these numbers. Erdogan's current term began in 2018. Back then, one dollar was worth around four liras. Now, one dollar equals 17 liras, more than four times higher. What about inflation? Even worse. In the month of May, inflation topped 73 percent, the highest in 23 years. Unemployment is almost at 12 percent. Foreign trade deficit is up 98.5 percent. In simple words, it's a full-blown economic crisis. Nonetheless, Erdogan is pushing on. This Thursday, he, he announced his candidacy for 2023. The candidate of the Kamhur Alliance should be announced. Here I say the candidate of the Kamhur Alliance is Tayyip Erdogan. Full marks for confidence. But how does Erdogan plan to get re-elected? If he campaigns on economy, his own staff may not vote for him. So what does Erdogan do? campaign on distractions. He's already, already announced two of them. First is the operation in Syria. Erdogan is planning to send Turkish soldiers into northern Syria. His plan is to create a 30-kilometer buffer zone. How will he do that? By driving away Kurdish fighters in the region. Now, both Russia and the U.S. have criticized this plan, both for different reasons. The U.S. because Kurdish fighters are their allies against ISIS. And Russia because they support the Assad regime in Damascus. But Erdogan does not care because he has leverage over both. The U.S. needs Erdogan's support to admit Finland and Sweden into NATO. Russia needs Erdogan as a mediator in Ukraine. So Turkey is counting on that leverage. But will it be enough? Kurdish fighters are planning to coordinate with the Syrian army, basically fight the bigger fish. Also this week, Syria and Russia held joint aerial drills. 
They have bolstered their presence in northern Syria. What do all these developments mean? A brewing conflict. If Syria is attacked, Putin cannot stand by and watch. If Turkey is attacked, NATO cannot stand by and watch. And the sad part? This too is a pointless war. It is not about strategy. It is not about security. It is about one man's political ambitions. Because fighting the Kurds is a populist move in Turkey. Erdogan's nationalist voters will love it. Which brings us to distraction number two, the new name. Turkey is now called Turkiye. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. So why would Erdogan do it? Because Turkey bolsters the nationalist cause. The history goes back to 1923. The new Turkish nation was born after World War I. And that's when the name Turkey emerged. And Erdogan is not the first leader to try this change. In the mid-1980s, an effort was made, but the campaign fizzled out. This time, though, Erdogan has got it done. Turkey has become Turkey. Does it solve higher inflation, though? No, it does not. Does it bolster the lira? No, it does not. But it could help his chances in 2023, and I'll tell you why. Turkish voters can be broadly split into two categories. One, the conservative voters. They mostly live in the Turkish countryside. And two, the progressive voters. They reside in the big cities. Erdogan's vote bank is the first category, the conservative rural voters. I'm talking about farmers, restaurant staff, gas station workers, fishermen. These people are Erdogan's biggest vote bank and right now they're struggling. Inflation is eating into their savings and chances are it will get worse because Erdogan does not believe in logic. He defies it. You see, when inflation rises, central banks hike interest rates. They discourage lending. Erdogan is doing the exact opposite. He has forced the Turkish central bank to reduce interest rates, or at least keep them steady. Now, I know what you're thinking. Aren't central banks independent? Well, in most democracies, yes, they are. But in Erdogan's Turkey, no, they're not. The president has fired three central bank governors since 2018. The current one is the fourth. So the message is quite simple. Do what I say or you're fired. The senseless economic policy could hurt him next year, which brings us to his challengers. Who will take on Erdogan in 2023? The opposition alliance is yet to announce their candidate, but three names stand out. Kemal Kilic Darolu. He is the leader of the CHP, the Republican People's Party. His big plus point, he's an economist. Another contender is this man, Ekrem Imamolu. He is serving as the mayor of Istanbul. It's a very powerful position in Turkey. Erdogan himself was once the mayor of Istanbul. And finally, Mansur Yavash. He's currently serving as the mayor of Turkey's capital, Ankara. All three have a good chance of winning because Erdogan has failed on all counts. He promised prosperity to the working class. He failed. He promised Islamic world dominance to nationalists. He failed, which leaves Erdogan with two options. One is distractions. And if that fails, an attack on democracy. That's another worry for Turkey. Erdogan could simply ban opposition parties or disqualify certain candidates. You see, leaders like Erdogan are always dangerous. But do you know when they are most dangerous? When they sense they are vulnerable. Our next story is from Pakistan. Earlier today, Islamabad unveiled its annual budget, one of the toughest budgets in its history. It comes during a swirling political crisis, a weakening currency, skyrocketing inflation and shortages of reserves. Given these challenges, the expectation was that this budget would be modest. It would mostly be aimed at restoring economic stability. Turns out that's not the case. Pakistan's priorities remain misplaced. So do most of the budget's allocations. This is despite an IMF reminder to Pakistan to mend its ways. On Thursday, the International Monetary Fund told Pakistan to renegotiate its deals with China, to try bargaining and reducing pending payments related to CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Here's a report. Pakistan has released its annual budget, a budget aimed at restoring economic stability, only that it falls way short of the mark. Inflation is making the common man suffer. Guess what Islamabad has decided to do? Increase the salaries of government employees only. By how much? 15%. What about the average Pakistani citizen? No such perks for them. What they've received are mere promises, like zero load shedding, more scholarship programs, special packages for the poor and better health programs. Then we have the CPEC, that is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, 
Two days back, the IMF had asked Pakistan to renegotiate CPEC deals to try bargaining and reduce outstanding payments. It said that this was necessary for financial stability. Guess what Pakistan has done? It has fast-tracked CPEC projects by providing additional funds. It has also adopted a framework for early start of special economic zones under the project. Guess where the most money has been allocated? To defense. Pakistan has set aside $7.6 billion for defense. That's over 1,500 billion Pakistani rupees. This is an increase of 6%. What explains it? The fear of unrest along Pakistan's border with Afghanistan. However, the Pakistan army says it will use most of this money for salaries, allowances and employee-related expenses. What about other sectors? How much money have they been allocated? For health, Pakistan has set aside 6 billion rupees. For education, Pakistan has allocated 12 billion rupees. If we put both these allocations together, it's not even half the money that has been allocated for defence. So to put it simply, Pakistan's annual budget for 2022 has yet again exposed its misplaced priority. The country is going through its worst phase economically. Inflation is at an all-time high of 13.8%. The rupee at an all-time low of 201 against the dollar. Foreign reserves have diminished to $9.27 billion. The GDP forecast has been reduced to 4.3%. At a time like this, Pakistan decides to spend the most on defense and Chinese projects. And here we thought the new government was expected to usher change in the country. From a Chinese vassal state, let's talk about a World Health body that became China's accomplice. I'm talking about the World Health Organization. China said the Wuhan virus does not transmit from humans. The WHO believed it. China said there was no lab leak. The WHO's investigators went along with that too, until an outraged global community stood up to question those findings. Now, the WHO is making a sharp U-turn. The World Health Body now wants a probe into the lab leak theory. Two and a half years into the pandemic, they've realized that a lot of questions still remain unanswered. And there is a need to look for more evidence, especially in China. So they've issued some preliminary recommendations um, to outline studies that need to be conducted so that we have the data, we have better knowledge about what may have happened in the beginning of this pandemic. And what you can see in the report is that they really outline that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in China and elsewhere. Last year, the WHO said a lab leak was extremely unlikely. Those are the words they used. Now the WHO has recommended a probe into it in the strongest possible words. What has changed? A new team has been appointed to look into the origins of the pandemic. It is called SAGO, the Scientific Advisory Group for the Origins of Novel Pathogens. Experts from 25 countries are part of this. It came together after the first investigation. In 2021, a group of investigators had gone to Wuhan. We told you about it. The probe was compromised from day one. China picked the team that was part of this investigation. It refused to give any raw data. China even pressured the investigators to drop the lab leak theory. By the time the report came out, the outcome was already clear. It was no secret. China not just influenced the investigation, it was practically trying to dictate it. But then came a sudden twist. The WHO Director General refused to accept China's claims. Dr. Ted Ross praised China's response to the pandemic in the very beginning, remember. But in a rare departure from his usual deference to China, he refused to rule out a lab leak. He even suggested the first assessment was not extensive enough. That's when Dr. Tedros ordered the second round of investigation. In July last year, he said dismissing the lab leak was premature. He also asked China to be more transparent. But as always, Beijing refused to cooperate. Behind the scenes, Dr. Tedros has been sending letters to Beijing. He wrote two of them in February this year. The first one went out to Chinese Premier Li Keqiang on the 14th of February. The second one was for Chinese Health Minister Ma Xiaowei. What did Dr. Tedros want from the Chinese? Information about laboratory hypothesis. What kind of information? The WHO won't tell. Did China reply to these letters from Dr. Tedros? The WHO won't tell that either. The fact remains that Beijing is blocking any attempts for another probe into China. It wants the world to accept the first report. The new group of investigators did engage with China. It was a futile attempt though. China sent a team of officials. Reports say 
they presented some new findings. But the investigators were not satisfied. Beyond the lab leak theory, they had questions about the Huanan seafood market, the same market that propelled the Wuhan virus to a pandemic. Investigators believe it needs to be studied further. So will the WHO be able to find the origins of the Wuhan virus? It failed to move quickly enough during the early days of the pandemic. Now more than two years have passed. Over six million people have died. With China's lack of transparency, reaching any conclusion looks impossible at the moment. There are doubts over the WHO's own competency. Remember that research on excess Wuhan virus deaths, the one that claimed nearly 10 times more people died in India? India contested that claim and questioned the WHO's methodology. Now, WHO's own researchers say there were errors in that report. Mistakes were made in calculating the mortality estimates of two countries, Germany and Sweden. Now, some corrections have been made there. Germany's estimate has been cut by 37%. Sweden's estimate has been raised by 19%. The WHO's credibility took a beating during the pandemic. Such mistakes will hardly, hardly restore trust in this world health body. And since we mentioned Sweden, did you know that Sweden once fought a 21-year-long war against Russia? It was in the 18th century. The war was orchestrated by Russian Tsar Peter the Great. He had captured land from Sweden and built on it what is modern-day St. Petersburg, Russian President Vladimir Putin's hometown, St. Petersburg. Putin was recently paying tribute to the Tsar on his 350th birth anniversary. The Russian president drew parallels between himself and Peter the Great. He said, just like the Tsar, Putin is not stealing foreign land. He's taking it back, what's rightfully Russia's. Putin was talking about Ukraine, and he basically seemed to suggest that going forward, Russia should consider calling him Putin the Great. Ask Vladimir Putin about the war in Ukraine, or what he calls the special military operation, and the Russian president will tell you that he's on a historic mission. What mission? One meant to reunite the Russian Empire, an empire that was once ruled by Peter the Great. He was Russia's first emperor. He ruled for 43 years. St. Petersburg is named after him. It is built on a land he conquered from Sweden. Peter the Great was reportedly admired by all Russians, liberals and conservatives alike. Centuries after Peter the Great's death, Vladimir Putin was born in the namesake town. He grew up admiring strong leaders and built his political career, wanting to undo what he claims are historical wrongs. Like the collapse of the Soviet Union or the independence of Ukraine, Putin has waged a war on Ukraine to undo on such wrong. In exchange, he demands nothing short of respect and reverence from the Russians. On Peter the Great's 350th birth anniversary, Putin compared himself to the emperor, stopping short of asking Russians to call him Putin the Great. When he founded the new capital, none of the European countries recognized the territory as Russian. They all recognize it as Swedish territory. The Slavs, together with the Finno-Ugric peoples, had always lived there. Moreover, this territory had been under the control of the Russian state. Same going towards the west, Narva and his first expeditions. Where did he go there? He went there to take it back and strengthen it. That's what he was doing. Well, it seems it has also fallen to us to take back and strengthen the territories. And if we take back these basic values as fundamental to our existence, we will prevail in solving the issues we are facing. Well, here's the problem. The Great Northern War ended in Sweden's defeat. It made Russia a leading power in the Baltic Sea, also an important player in European affairs. Peter the Great wanted to bring Russia closer to Europe. In Putin's case, he is neither winning the war nor is he bringing the country closer to Europe. Quite the opposite, in fact. Russians know this too well. I think that the window to Europe is gradually closing. I hope it won't close fully. It's happening because everyone is against our country. They're angry. And it's not our fault that the window is still closing. It would be good if there were a window cut, but also a door to walk through to it from both sides. 
Russians don't seem convinced that Putin should be called great, but tell this to the Russian president and he will make you see history through his biased lens. One where Ukraine should never have been allowed independence. One where Russia never annexed Crimea. One where Peter the Great should not be remembered for his affinity to Europe, but only for his expansion of Russia. Peter the Great had fought the Northern War for 21 years. It seemed he was fighting with Sweden and seizing territories. He wasn't seizing anything, he was taking them back. Just like Putin, he's taking Ukraine back. But who's buying his story? We're often told that time heals everything, but that's not always true. Time cannot heal colonial crimes, for instance. The Jallianwala Bagh massacre is still fresh in the hearts of Indians. Congo has not healed from the torture of Belgium's rule. You already know what happened at Jallianwala. Let me tell you about the Congo story. Between 1885 and 1960, 10 million Congolese died. Rather, they were killed by Belgium's policies, be it through forced labor or famines. Belgium orchestrated human rights abuse of the worst kind in Congo. And Belgium is not sorry. Like Britain, Belgium too has just regrets to offer for its colonial crimes. Listen to this. On the occasion of my trip to Congo, right here, in front of the Congolese people and those who today are still suffering, I wish to reaffirm my deepest regrets for those past wounds. This is Belgium's King Philippe. He was speaking during his first visit to Congo, and this is King Leopold II. He once ruled Belgium. This was between 1885 and 1908. From the day Leopold II came to power, he made Congo his personal property. Congo was turned into a labor camp. People were forced to grow rubber, and everyone was given a quota to meet. While the harvest made Leopold II richer, back in Congo, people's hands were cut off for not meeting their quota. If a family failed to produce enough natural rubber, the hands of women and children were cut off too. Those who resisted the atrocities had their feet cut off. Here too, Belgian troops did not spare women and children. Apparently, chopping off limbs was Belgium's way of proving their superiority over the Congolese. Goes without saying, the people of Congo lived in brutal conditions. Women were raped, tormented. Leopold II oversaw these atrocities. The Belgian king died in 1909. A year before his death, Congo was transferred to the Belgian government. From a personal property, Congo became a colony. But its suffering and humiliation continued. Congo finally became independent in 1960, but Belgium did not let go of its colony easily. Belgium's then king delivered an address celebrating Leopold II, even calling him a genius. Congo's independence is the achievement of the work devised by the genius of King Leopold II. Congo is reaching the status on this day, the 30th of June, 1960. When Congo elected its first prime minister, Belgian-backed secessionists assassinated him. In 2002, the Belgian government took partial responsibility for this assassination. Cut to 2022, many in Congo say while they may be able to forgive Belgium for colonizing their country, the, at the atrocities cannot be forgiven. Earlier this week, when King Philippe landed in Kinshasa, the people of Congo were expecting an apology, and rightly so. As a Congolese, I can say welcome to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Your Majesty. But this time, have the courage to say sorry to the Congolese people. The simple regret that you have expressed is not enough, because since the independent state of Congo, with the hands cut off, it is the Congo that bore the weight of two world wars for the benefit of Belgium. Philippe did not apologize. King Leopold II was the brother of Philippe's great-great-grandfather, which makes Philippe not just a, a successor, but also family. Let us write this new chapter together without forgetting the past but by assuming it fully in order to transmit to the new generation. Well, that's the thing about colonial criminals. They hate accountability. Be it Britain or Belgium, the mindset is the same. Not apologizing for past crimes is their way of burying uncomfortable history. Do you know Belgium's colonial rule is not even taught properly in their own schools? Apparently, the country does not like to talk about its colonial past. 
Well, I have bad news for Belgium. People will hold Belgium accountable sooner rather than later. Remember, Leopold II's statue was one of the many symbols of hate that people defaced during the 2020 protests. People are rising up against attempts to whitewash history. Sooner rather than later, both Belgium and Britain will have to apologize for their colonial crimes. If you're a science buff, our next story is for you. NASA has decided to study alien life. It is launching a probe to understand UFO sightings, to find out if the sightings are indeed real and settle the debate once and for all. This study will begin later this year. It will last for at least nine months and it will cost NASA $100,000. Now this decision has led to a debate. Some are excited that NASA has finally delved into the subject. Others say the space agency is sabotaging its own reputation. Here's a report. NASA is getting serious about aliens. Earlier this week, its chief, Bill Nelson, confirmed his belief in alien life. He said he personally believed that extraterrestrial life is out there somewhere. This was on Wednesday. Two days on, NASA has decided to launch a study on UFOs. A study to find if aliens exist and what kind of objects they fly. The intention is noble, settle the most vexed debate in science, the existence of extraterrestrial life. Here's what the space agency intends to do. Set up an independent team of space experts, analyze how information is publicly available, find out how much more is needed to study unexplained sightings, and consider how to use this information for future studies. So when will the study begin? In the fall of 2022. How long will it last? A total of nine months. How much will it cost? At least a hundred thousand dollars. And who's going to lead it? This man, astrophysicist David Spurgel, the president of Simons Foundation. Here's what he says the study will be aimed at. Given the paucity of observations, our first task is simply to gather the most robust set of data that we can, Spurgel said. We will be identifying what data from civilians, government, non-profits, companies, exists, what else we should try to collect, and how best to analyze it. NASA's decision has evoked all kinds of responses. Some are intrigued about the proposed study. Others are wondering if it's some kind of a joke, whether NASA has fallen for pop culture. The chief of NASA's science mission says he understands the criticism. He says the space agency is aware of the reputational risk involved and has assured the scientific community that NASA is not selling out. And while NASA hunts for aliens, things on Earth are getting worse. Climate change is making our planet uninhabitable. Our rains are erratic, our cyclones are supercharged, and our droughts are biblical. These changes could soon affect your favorite food. It's already happening in the U.S. Americans are bracing for a sriracha shortage. Some sauce lovers are already stocking up for the looming crisis. Here's more. Hot, red and fiery, this spicy sauce is a classic American favorite. The sriracha. You can put it in your soup, on eggs, in burgers, and if you are feeling a bit adventurous, in your cocktails. The recipe is pretty straightforward. Chili peppers, some vinegar, garlic and a dash of salt. Your sriracha sauce is ready. In the US, one company dominates this market. Haifeng Foods. In America, you don't buy sriracha sauce. You buy Haifeng sriracha sauce. But in April, the company had an ominous warning. Unfortunately, we cannot confirm that there is an unprecedented shortage of our products. We are still endeavoring to resolve this issue that has been caused by several spiraling events, including unexpected crop failure from the spring chili harvest. No chili, no sriracha. Haifeng buys most of their chili from California, New Mexico and Mexico. 
all three places are struggling with extreme temperatures and drought. The result? Very low chili output. Haifang has announced a freeze on new orders until September. They hope by then the weather clears. But try telling that to source heads. They are preparing for a source again. Take a look at this Twitter user. Their shopping cart is packed with sriracha sauce. We count at least 13 bottles. Such hoarding tactics help nobody. But such is the love for sriracha. People are lining up to stock their favorite hot sauce. Not everybody may get a bottle, which means America will soon need some hot sauce alternatives. But this problem goes beyond just sauce. Climate change is affecting most crops. By 2030, corn output is expected to fall 24%. Wheat could be another victim. Right now, 15% of wheat growing areas are affected by droughts. That could rise to 60% in the coming decades. There's bad news for coffee lovers too. Brazil might soon become too hot to produce coffee. The wild coffee trees of Africa too are wilting. At this rate, your daily cup of coffee could soon be a luxury. From hot sauce to wheat to coffee, climate change is threatening our most basic need, food. If this isn't a call for action, nothing is. And now let's take a look at what else is making news across the world. These are Gravitas Global Headlines. China will not hesitate to start a war over Taiwan, says its defense spokesperson as the U.S. and Chinese defense ministers held their first face-to-face -face talks in Singapore. Ukrainian President Zelensky says that Ukrainian forces were holding on in the flashpoint eastern cities of Eridonesk, where intense street battles with Russian troops could determine the fate of the Donbass region. China's commercial hub of Shanghai faces another round of mass COVID-19 testing for most residents this weekend, as it races to stop a wider outbreak after discovering a few cases in the community. In yet another shooting incident in the United States, a shooter opened fire at a manufacturing facility in northern Maryland, killing at least three people. There was no immediate word on a possible motive. Tens of thousands of protesters marched in the Argentinian capital of Buenos Aires to demand better pay and proper jobs and to protest the government's deal with the International Monetary Fund. More than 3,000 prisoners convicted of marijuana offenses were released across Thailand. The move came after Thailand became the first Asian nation to decriminalize growing marijuana. At least 17 people have been killed in China after landslides partially buried several villages after days of rain left hillsides waterlogged and prone to mudslides. As the wildfire in southern Spain continued to spread, emergency agencies have deployed almost 1,000 firefighters, military personnel and support crews to fight in. Three firefighters have been injured so far. Cristiano Ronaldo's Portugal beat Czech Republic 2-0 to maintain their encouraging start to the UEFA Nations League. The 2019 champions have seven points from three games and are top of Group A2. Reigning French Open champion Iga Sjantek will skip the grass court tournament in Berlin due to a shoulder issue, but the world number one plans to return for Wimbledon, which begins on the 27th of June. 
with that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching. Do join us for a Gravitas Colombo edition coming up tomorrow. And we'll see you there.